Hey guys, we're going to be talking about chapter 7, the axial skeleton. Let me make me a little bit smaller. Okay, we covered this in class. At least one of my classes have. But I want to go through and make sure everybody's kind of good on this. Alright, the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton is going to be the skull. It's going to be the uh, vertebrae, the rib cage, and the sternum. That's the axial skeleton. Basically, everything else is going to be the appendicular skeleton. And by appendicular, I mean the uh, part of the skeleton that consists of the arms and the legs and the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle, also known as the hips. Okay, let's focus on the skull right now. There are two sets of bones to make up our skull. We've got the cranial bones, which is for the dome of the skull, and then we have the facial bones that make up our, that are underneath our face. <coughs> the cranial vault right up here is called the calvaria. If you look down into the skull, you'll see that there are shelves. There's a shelf right up here. There's another shelf a little bit lower down here, and then there's a third one toward the back. And of course, that's interior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. Uh, the cranial bones have markings on them that help uh, give us a place for the muscles to attach. And we'll talk more about that coming up. Facial bones are going to be the guys that form the back, the frame that the muscles and the skin of your face attach to. We're going to have certain uh, holes for sight, for taste, and for smell. We're going to have holes for our eyes and for our nose and for our mouth. Openings, of course, that's for the air and the food passage. And the facial bones also provide the attachment points for our teeth. We'll come across this. Here you can see the cranial bones versus the facial bones, and it kind of makes sense. We're going into them in a lot more detail. I think I'm in the way, guys. Let me move me away over here and get out of the way. Okay. This is an extraordinarily busy slide. There's a lot on there. But it's also one of the best slides that I have. It's a good reference slide. I'm not going to go through this because we're going to go through each of these bones individually. But this is a good way to see that all put together as one unit and color coded so that you can tell which bones are which. The frontal bone, that kind of golden colored. This other yellowish color going to be the temporal, the parietal, that kind of pinkish, reddish color. So anyway, use this part as a reference for yourself. Here's the same thing just from a lateral view. You can see again the parietal, the occipital, temporal, frontal. This is part of the sphenoid bone. Most of the time we're going to be looking at that from inside the skull. But it does have pieces on the outside, as does the ethmoid bone right there. Kind of makes up the part of the uh, medial surface of the, of the eye cavity, the orbital. Again, from the back, you can see it, the occipital bone. You see these sutures. When we're born, not all the skull bones are connected yet, and there's a reason for that. We want our head to be flexible so that we can make it through the birth canal and be born. And so that's what we have with this guy. There's sagittal suture. This is the lambdoid. And there's even some small bones called sutural bones that sometimes are embedded in there. The occipital bone is kind of the back right here. They've got these ridges, superior nuchal line and the inferior nuchal line. These are guys are running kind of horizontally. The external occipital protuberance is going to be right here, and it's kind of running vertically. And it's it's 
it's very pronounced on the skull models. Again, a very busy slide, but nonetheless, it's a good reference point to start with. You can see all of the bones from the bottom. You can also see some of these holes that we have important things coming in and out of. Uh, there's the hard palate of the mouth. This part here is actually part of the maxillary bone, while this part is actually the palatine bone. We'll talk more about that also coming up, guys. Okay, starting, oh, let's see, okay. Make sure I stay out of the way of the words. The frontal bone, uh, there we go, I'm out of the way, I think. It's going to be in the front part, it's this is your forehead, is basically what it is, the bone underneath the forehead. It's going to occupy a good chunk of the of the front of the of the skull, uh, most of that anterior cranial fossa. It's going to be the upper or superior edges of the orbits where the eyes sit. And there are frontal sinuses, which are basically holes in the bone. It makes the bone lighter, but it also gives us, has to do with warming and humidifying the air before we breathe it in. Also gives resonance to our voice if you, uh, when you have a cold and your sinuses are filled, your voice sounds considerably different. Ooh, I am going to be in the way no matter where I'm at on this one. Let me move again. Come on, move me. Go move me out of the way for a second. So the parietal bones, these are the guys that occupy the top lateral parts of the skull. And you can see them right there. So they're going to be behind the frontal bone, and the frontal bone is separated from the parietal by the coronal or frontal suture. Uh, aside from that, these guys are separated from the temporal bone right here by the squamous suture. They're separated from the occipital bone by the lambdoidal suture and the right and left parietal themselves are separated by the sagittal suture. Uh, it's pretty much all everything I can think of. A lot of this stuff on here guys, there's a lot more detail on here than you and I need but it's a good picture so I, I grabbed it. Okay the occipital bone will be most of the posterior portion there's the outside, you can see those nuchal lines, and this big hole is called the foramen magnum. That's where the spinal cord comes out from the brain. Um, this guy is going to be the one who attaches right here. Those guys are called condyles, occipital condyles. They're going to attach to the first vertebrae, which is your backbone, and that's what the head is going to sit on. Uh, ligamentum, nuchae, these are just ligaments that help hold the bones together. And again, you can see from these various uh, angles what we have with the occipital bone. Okay, let's continue on. Temporal bone, this is the part that's right. I don't know if you guys can see me. Okay, it's going to be right here. Your temple, right? Inferolateral aspects of the skull, in other words, it's on the bottom and the side, and this company also form part of the actual bottom of the, of the skull as well. The regions, we've got a petrous region, they don't have that on our lab list anymore, but we do have the mastoid process. The mastoid process, we'll, let's see if I can see that right there. That doesn't look really good. It's kind of a rounded, oops, okay, it's kind of a, a rounded kind of inverted cone. It's very prominent. You can see it on the bottom right there. We have this styloid process which is very thin, almost needle-like, and this guy is going to be an attachment point and here's an extremely important thing, the external acoustic 
meatus. Sometimes you'll hear that called the external uh, uh, auditory meatus. It's basically the same thing. What it is is the hole in the bone to allow the nerves to go from your middle ear to your brain. The nerves can't go through solid bone. We've got to have a hole there. And if we have an external, well, that's the outside. That's the outside. Where is that? Yeah, it is. They're just, they just got this guy. They're, they're looking at the bottom of it, but and they're not showing us an inside view. And we'll wait on that. Oh, while I'm at this, the squamous part is this part right here. If you remember, we talked about the squamous suture. When we say squamous, we mean that that part of the bone is relatively flat. Tympanic uh, is going to be around the area of the uh, auditory meatus. So tympanic, mastoid, squamous, the petrous portion is going to be on the inside, but we're not really doing a lot with that. Um, you can't see it from this outside thing. Okay, here's the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone it looks like a bat. It really does. Now, let's see. They're showing us showing us this is from the front. Nah, that's not a good view, but it's what we got. Here's a better view right here. Now, this is the inside of the skull. There's the interior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. But this larger portion right here, it's really easy to see, is going to be the greater wing of the sphenoid. The smaller one is going to be the lesser. The pterygoid processes are right there. They're really easy to see on the skull. And you've got a pair on the left and a pair on the right. The one that's outermost is lateral. The one that's innermost is medial. But in any case, you can see how the sphenoid, it also makes up part of the orbit. A lot of bones make up the orbit. It's very complicated. The ethmoid bone, this is for our purpose, not quite as, as difficult. There are an ethmoid air cells, ethmoid sinus. There's a sphenoid sinus, ethmoid frontal, and we got a maxillary right here. We'll see that in a little bit. Um, it's going to be the top part of the nasal septum. The nasal septum is that part that uh, divides our nostrils into a left and right. Uh, it's going to be the roof of the nasal cavities. Right there, you can see this from the inside of the skull. You got this thing called the crista gyli. It sticks up, and on either side, you have this thing called the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate, you see all those little holes in it. That's where actually nerve fibers come from the nose to get into the brain to be sent to the area to be interpreted. Uh, there's the middle nasal concha and superior nasal concha. You really can't see on this one, but I'll we'll we'll go over that too when we get a chance. The mandible is the only part of the skull that's movable, and it's actually connected to it through a joint. It's not actually. I mean, aside from that one joint, it's not connected. That's why it's easy to dislocate your jaw. This condylar process is going to fit into a little bow-like depression um, that's on the temporal bone, and that's where it's going to fit. This coronoid process is going to fit right there behind the zygomatic bone. So there's our, there's the 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 mandible. This part that's vertical is the ramus. This horizontal part is the body. And this part where it changes direction is called the angle. We've got two little holes on here on the chin and they're called the mental foramen. That's because if you remember, the mental is the area name for the chin. 
We also have a foramen back here. A foramen, again, is just a hole. And those are the mandibular foramen. They're on the inside of the ramus. Okay. The maxillary bone is going to be this bone right up here. It's where the top of your teeth are going to attach. It is a very important bone. If you look at it right there in the center, there are a lot of other bones that attach to it. <clears throat> okay, so here's the front part, uh, the top here where the, the comes in. It's going to, um, the main thing that it's going to do, as far as we're concerned right now, is form the, maybe the three, the, the three-fourths of the hard palate, the roof of your mouth, is going to be the maxillary, maxillary, maxillary bone, but that part in itself is named according to the bone it attaches to. And this is something that confuses folks, but the bones, when you have a piece of a bone that connects to another bone, and then we call it a process, we name it according to the bone it attaches to. So this is the maxilla, and that is the palatine bone. So this is called the palatine process of the maxilla. We're going to run across this again in just a few minutes, guys. And here's a few minutes. This is your cheekbones, the zygomatic bones. Now this part of the zygomatic bone attaches to the temporal bone. We call that the temporal process of the zygomatic. There's a piece coming from right here, coming from the temporal bone, and we call that the zygomatic process of the, tempo, of the temporal bone. In any case, these guys are going to form a part of the outer rim on the orbit. But they're mainly our cheekbones. That's their claim to fame. And there's, of course, muscles that we'll get to later. The nasal bone, very tiny bone, is just right up here. Because you know that from the bridge of your nose down, it's basically cartilage, and that's the bone. Now, this part is the maxillary bone, so only this part right in the center. And there's two pieces, of course, that are fused, but... Those are the actual nasal bones, really easy. Lacrimal bones, these guys are inside the orbit of the skull. They are very tiny. They have a hole in them, and it's called a lacrimal canal. Tears roll down from the outside of our eyes toward the, toward the nose and they drain through that lacrimal, lacrimal canal. That's the easiest way to, to remember this guy, is that this is going to be the guy that where our tears drain out at. The lacrimal gland, we haven't got there yet, is going to be part, when we study the eye, will be the thing that produces tears. Okay, here's another good one. You can see the palatine process of the maxilla, the palatine bone. Now, there is those middle nasal concha. Here's the inferior nasal concha. You cannot see the superior nasal concha because it just is buried up here into those bones. I don't even have a model. Posterior one-third, eh, it looks more like a quarter to me, but I'm not going to argue with these folks very small part of the orbit is part of the palatine bone but it's the last part of the hard palate before you get to the soft palate the back of your mouth the vomer this guy right here above that is the ethmoid bone and it is actually the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid this guy is going to be called the vomer now the perpendicular plate goes pretty straight up and down, but the vomer comes off at an angle. It's really easy to see that. Plow-shaped, well, that's, that's reasonable. 
and it forms the lower part of that separation between the nostrils, the septum. Inferior nasal concha, we just talked about it right there. They are not a whole lot more to say about that. It's pretty straightforward. The sutures, we've already covered those, but here's here's another. Now there's more sutures on here than you are required to know with this level. So occipitomastoid suture, well these things don't even show up on our models, so and it's not on your lab list, so we're not really going to go in there. We just want to know the four main sutures that we're going to be dealing with. The rest of these, it's good to know, but it's not really very critical. So we'll just leave those be. But these are really good images, so I decided it was worth getting it. Fissures, sutures and fissures, and... <coughs> <coughs> We're going to talk about foramina. Foramina is just the, the plural of foramen. Foramen is a hole. Now a canal is a foramen that has a long run through bone like a tunnel. Now they're calling this the optic foramen. Most of the time you hear that referred to as the optic canal because of that. Superior nasal, or excuse me, superior orbital fissure, we'll talk about that one too. I, there's a better way to see that from the underside. We'll get to that. The foramen magnum we've already talked about, that's the guy that <coughs> has the, uh, the opening so that the brain stem transitions into the spinal cord and through there. The jugular foramen simply a big hole <coughs> in which the deoxygenated blood from the brain goes back to the heart. Um, the internal auditory meatus, that's where the, uh, and again, you see acoustic at auditory, same thing. This guy comes, this is where the, the nerve coming, comes in. You can't see it, they don't have it marked here, but right up around here, you would see the internal carotid canal. One way you can tell that guy is it's going to be very round. Kind of small, but round, very round. The ferrosum, ferrosum, hey little buddy. The foramen spinosum is going to be the outside. It's going to be very small. The foramen oval right here is going to be the next one. And then the foramen lacerum is going to be closest to the center of the skull. The uh, foramen rotundum is not on our lab list, so we're not going to go through with that. But it's there if you need to know it. Now, as far as the fissures, the two fissures are superior orbital fissure right there, and then the inferior orbital fissure and it looks like a V-shaped coming off of the eye with the wide end pointing laterally. And right there would be the optic canal. But you can see you, they've got this kind of covered up so you can't see it. Usually you can see it as a V-shaped on our models. Okay, the sinuses, we kind of talked about those a little bit, but let's go ahead and go into it. These guys have mucosa. They are, they are air, air spaces. Yeah, they make the skull a little bit less heavy, and we talked about resonance. But the main thing with these guys is the air goes in there, and thanks to, the, thanks to those nasal conchi, the air kind of swirls around, and it gets a chance to be warmed up and to have moisture added to it before it goes to our lungs. Cold, dry air doesn't sit well with the lungs. We like it warm and, and wet. So in any case, those are the, the frontal right up here, maxillary. The others are too deep to actually be able to uh, do anything with on a normal physical. The ethmoid sinus or the air cells <coughs> and the sphenoid way down in there. Okay, hyoid bone is actually 
it's not on the skull and it doesn't actually connect to any other bone <coughs> in the body it's right here and it's there for the muscles involved in swallowing and speaking are able to attach I need to get over here again guys so I can stay out of y'all's way okay the vertebral column the vertebrae these are the guys that make up your backbone there are like let's see 19 24 there's 24 separate vertebrae and then there's one chunk of five vertebrae that are fused together and then a, a tiny chunk of smaller vertebrae but these are the guys that take the weight of the body at each level and and have that force transmitted downward so that those real strong bones and muscles of our legs can support our weight we have uh, seven of those in our neck they're called cervical we have 12 in the chest those are called thoracic they are the ones that are attached to ribs and then down below that we have our lower back we have the lumbar we have five the sacrum is five vertebrae that are permanently fused together into one bone and it's going to be further down and at the very end of the sacrum you have the cossex, which is four, it's variable, three to five vertebrae, tiny, that are fused together. They think that that used to be tails of people. I don't know about that. Whew, now I'm in the way again. Okay, guys, here you can see this. There, there we go, and they've got these kind of color-coded, the cervical, the first seven. T1 through T12 is going to be our thoracic, and of course, they're attached to ribs. L1 through L5 is our lumbar. There's the sacrum. You can kind of see where these guys used to be separate, but they're now they're fused together. And this tiny little thing down there is the cossacks. Right there, they're saying four, but it varies. Now, the, uh, our vertebrae, our backbone curves it's not straight up and down ramrod straight doesn't really exist it would be it would be malfunctioning it would be pathological so we have a concave vertebrae curvature on the top so the neck if this were the front of my if this were the front of my face then this guy it's kind of hard to do this Got to make sure I can, you guys can see me. So this is the front, and this guy is going to curve outward, and they call that concave. Now, if you come down here to the thoracic, it curves toward the back, and that's convex. Then the next one, the lumbar, is also going to be concave, going to curve toward the front, and then the sacrum and the cossacks are going to curve convex toward the back now there that's the norm we get all kinds of abnormalities kyphosis you can look here and see that the spaces between these vertebrae are not equal some of them are wider on one side than they are the other <coughs> this is an abnormal curvature in which person people are hunched over like that a lot of times you see that with uh, petite females, uh, especially if they, if they have osteoporosis, and you get some you get some fractures of the vertebrae because they get so weak. Well, we talked all about that already, but this is just what some of what you see. Lordosis, and again, you can see it here in the lumbar region. If you look at the gaps between those vertebrae they are wildly different this one you can tell it's got a big angle on it pretty close together right there now a lot of times expectant mothers will adopt this because of the extra weight in the front they have to arch their back like that in order to get it but there are actually pathological um, conditions in which this occurs and let me move me 
there you see the normal curvature and there you see the, the lordotic. Finally, we got scoliosis. Now on this one, the curve is from side to side rather than front or back like the other two. And you can see this one. Now there's a front picture of it. You can see a little bit of the curve, but <coughs> this one is really pronounced right there. Very, very. These kind of things have to have surgery. It's just, it's a bad thing. Whoops, I'm in the way again. Okay, the general structure of the vertebrae. <coughs> we have this spinous process coming off the back. And then we have two of these guys. They're called transverse processes. They're coming off kind of at an angle. Now, the the piece of the bone between the spinous process and the transverse process is called the lamina. The piece between the transverse and the main part or the body is called the pedicle. Now here you can also see they call this superior articular process. This is the place where this guy connects to the to the vertebrae above him. Here you can see it a little bit better, superior and inferior. That's a lumbar vertebrae right there, of course. Okay, the body is where the weight is transmitted. We know we've got a disc in there, a fibrocartilage. Uh, the arch coming out from the body, the pedicles and the lamina. And of course, they make a hole called the vertebral foramen. That's where the spinal cord sits in, in that little bony cage to try to protect it from damage. Now, this part right here, I mean, that's the vertebral foramen. This part right here, when another vertebrae connects, this part right here is going to be kind of enclosed. <coughs> that's called the intervertebral foramen. And these are where the nerves come out from the spinal cord to innervate your muscles and provide sensation. Okay, Let's see if I can get down a little bit. Okay, without getting in the way. So the inner vertebral disc has got two parts this fibrous part called the annulus fibrosis. Annulus just means ring. And then nucleus pulposus, kind of gelatinous, gives a little bit of compression. Think of it as a cushion. <coughs> the fibrotic portion is intended to hold this in. This is a cushion to keep every time we walk, when we bounce up and down, we don't want our spine, our bones our, to hit each other. Now over here we see some, some different things that can go wrong. Disc protrusion, the entire disc moves out. And it's not the nucleus pulposus per se, is it so much as it's the fibrosis and you see right there, it's pinching a nerve that is very painful, and it does not stop. Now, on this one, we've got the disc herniation. Here we have part of the nucleus pulposus is actually pushing out toward that nerve. And that is the, basically the same thing, only it's kind of at a different uh, location. Instead of off to the side, it's straight back. <clears throat> and you see it pressing on the spinal cord. This can give you all kinds of problems with sensation, with motor control, and pain. And here we get what they call sequestration, where you get parts of this kind of almost taking up uh, on their own and pushing on those nerves. All of these are very painful. We move down here now. <coughs> Cervical vertebrae, C1 to C7, these guys are small, fairly light because they're only holding up the head. That's all the weight they have to bear, so they don't have to be thick and chunky. C3 and C through C7, C1 and C2 are totally different. They're like nothing else, and we'll go over those. But the rest of them, they have their spinous process. A lot of times, they're kind of split. They call it a bifid. <coughs> C7 is an, is an exception to that. They got a large 
vertebral foramen. And this is really one of the key things. These guys have got a transverse process right to the side of the, of the uh, not transverse process, transverse foramen. So in their transverse process, they have a hole. <coughs> There's arteries that run in there called the vertebral arteries nonetheless. Okay, guys, here's what, it, here's what these guys kind of look like. That top one right there is called C1. It's also called the atlas. <coughs> if you remember those occipital condyles on the skull, this is what they sit on right there. Now, this guy is basically a circle of bone. That is what he is. No body, uh, no spinous process. It is a circle of bone. And that's what the skull sits on. Down below him is C2. He's more like the uh, rest of the, the vertebrae, but he still is very unique. Now, he has a piece of bone that sticks up vertically right, like that. So this bone sticks up like this, and here comes the atlas. And he rotates like this so we can turn our head side to side. And then starting with three, C3 through C7, they become, you know, more classical cervical. Now, here's, here's a rule of thumb, guys. Where you get a, a boundary between like C7 and T1 or T12 and L1, these guys are gradually phasing into the next look. So C7 looks a lot like T1. On a, on a fully articulated skeleton, no problem. <laughs> T1 has a rib attached to it, and C7 doesn't. But if you see one of those, again, what you're going to be looking for are going to be those uh, transverse foramen. That's, that's the best way I can tell you to think of it. <clears throat> okay, here is our C1, the atlas. You can see it is basically a circle of bone. There's the superior articular facet that the occipital condyle sit on. And again, those transverse foramen. And no spinous process. You do have a transverse process of sort, but... Here is C2. Let me get out of the way again. So he's a circle of bone, not much of a body, but it's got kind of sort of something. And it's got that dentoid process, which we just call the dens <coughs> for short. And again, it's the rotation part. And that's pretty much well what he's got going on. Got very small transverse process. Got a small spinous process. Not much, but he's got it. Okay, T1 through T12. Okay, guys, thoracic vertebrae, T1 to 12, they all have a place for the ribs. The ribs actually attach in two places. The head of the rib attaches on the body, and there's a part of the rib where you get that curvature that's going to attach to one of the transverse processes. And, of course, you got ribs on both sides, so... There's where they are. These guys are going to be chunkier than the cervical. The body is going to be kind of heart-shaped. Mm. Spinous process, transverse, no transverse foramen. And look at the spinous process. It has a pretty sharp downward angle. Again, T12 looks a lot like L1. But for the most part, this is the way that we're going to be uh, seeing these guys. And again, they're, they're transmitting more weight, so they have to be chunkier. Here you can see right there is that intervertebral foramen I was telling you about. <coughs> so the spinal cord is in the vertebral foramen, and it, out of here comes the spinal, spinal nerves. And you can see there's the inferior process of this uh, vertebrae attaching the superior facet of this one. So, I mean, it's... They fit together. It's, it's actually kind of angled like that. The intervertebral disc between there. 
Okay, the lumbar vertebrae, these guys are toward the bottom. They are big and chunky. Now, spinous transverse process, big chunky body. And here, you see that spinous process is not sharp and pointed <coughs> like in the cervical or thoracic, and it's not pointed sharply down like the thoracic. So it's kind of short and blunt. Let me move out of the way again. Short, thick pedicles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Flat, hatchet shaped. That's a good way of describing it. These guys are not intended to move. <laughs> not give us any flexibility from that area. If you try to do it, then you're going to have some problems. And you can see, let me move out of the way again. You can see these guys coming together and they, they kind of lock. Now, these guys aren't like this, they're more like that, and they're kind of locking them in place, those superior and inferior articular processes. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just gonna be in the way no matter where I go. Okay, let me see if you try to stay out of the way as much. Well, that didn't work, okay. The sacrum S1 through S5 fused together this is going to be the back wall <coughs> of the pelvis. This guy is going to attach to L5, and it's also going to have an area where it's going to attach to the hip bones to the sides. And on the bottom, the cossacks, three to five, and this guy is going to attach the sacrum. <coughs> Let me move out of the way again. So there's the sacral promontory. That's what L5 connects to. There is a disc there. Here are the ala, and if you looked over here, there's kind of this roughened area. This is where the hip bone attaches to the sacrum. These guys are called sacral foramina. Foramina, again, is just the plural foramen. This is where uh, a lot of our nerves exit to go into the pelvis. Now, there is also a sacral canal, but you can't see it on this picture from here. Here you can see one, two, three, four tiny vertebrae all fused together. That's the cossacks. Oh, there it is. There's the sacral canal on the back side. This thing kind of, kind of balloons out, and you've got like this tunnel between this body and this area right here. And again, there are things that use that. Now... Most of this stuff in here are not going to be on your lab list, so don't sweat it. Okay, I'm in the way again. I always am. Thoracic cage. Thoracic cage is, well, you can see it really good right here. We've got the sternum in the middle. This is your breastbone. There's the vertebrae we just went over. Here comes the ribs off those vertebrae. Now, they don't attach directly to another bone. They attach to a piece of cartilage, which attaches to the sternum. Now, we got the first seven of those actually attached to the sternum. Eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 actually don't attach to the sternum. They attach to a piece of cartilage, which attaches to the sternum. Nonetheless, the thoracic cage is here to protect your lungs and your heart. Uh, gives some support for our shoulder blades, for the upper limbs. Got a lot of muscles attached there. Um, okay, here's the sternum. Now, if you look, that super sternal notch is also called the jugular notch. It's where the jugular veins come back into the chest from the head, <coughs> bringing that deoxygenated blood. That's where the first rib attaches, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then the eighth, ninth, tenth, eleven, excuse me, eight, nine, ten, attach to a piece of cartilage that attaches to this cartilage. And then eleven and twelve, we call them false ribs, they're just floating. Okay, so the sternum itself has got three parts. This top part is called the manubrium. The main part is just called the body. That's pretty straightforward. 
the little part down here is the xiphoid process. Its main claim to fame is that it keeps getting broken while we do CPR, but you got to try to save somebody's life, even if it breaks a little bit of a bone, <laughs> especially a small bone like that. Twelve pairs attach to the thoracic vertebrae. We already talked about that. One through seven, true. Eight through twelve are false. And 11 and 12 are false ribs, but they're also floating ribs because they don't attach to anything at all. Okay, the main part, the head, and we saw that, that place on the thoracic vertebrae where the head, here's that angle, and there's a place for that turbicle or thick part of the rib to attach. And then the rest of it goes around and attaches to this cartilage, which attaches to it head, the neck, like everything else. You've always got a neck under a head. Uh, superior costal is where the head attaches. Transverse for the turbicle or that thickened part. <coughs> we already kind of talked about that. And that's the same thing, just looking from a different angle. It's actually pretty good. You can see how the rib fits in there, and that's the ligaments that hold these guys together and we're not even seeing all the ligaments most of the ligaments on these bones we are not showing because it would add a lot of detail and make it harder to see everything okay bone diseases osteomalacia uh, that's what we call it in adults in children it's called rickets what happens is that there's too little calcium. It could either be from calcium or not having enough vitamin D, which enables you to absorb calcium. So the osteoblasts are going to lay down their collagen, but there's not going to be enough calcium. And so this thing is, the bone is not going to be coated with enough of those hard crystals. And you get this bow right here. These guys, of course, obviously, they're with this weird angles, the weight that it's bearing might tend to cause these guys to fracture. These guys can be um, dealt with by calcium or vitamin D, whatever the problem is. Osteoporosis, this is the disease that we see in the elderly, mostly. There's the normal trabecular bone, spongy bone. Here is the early osteoporosis, and here is a later. And then looking down here, you see the normal spacing between the trabeculae gets way wide. And in here, it's very, very pronounced. Uh, again, you see some of the normal um, bones here. And here you see these guys. Now, when the spongy bone in the disc, or excuse me, the vertebrae, get weakened like that, the weight that's on that vertebrae will actually cause that thing to be, to kind of collapse. It's going to be a, a compression fracture. And this is one of the things that can cause this uh, kyphosis we talked about. You can also get it, especially if it's in the neck of the femur. This guy is bearing a lot of weight. And if this guy is not sturdy, it's going to break. Bone pain, fracture with no, no actual trauma, loss of height, that's normal aging, but it's more pronounced. Chronic back pain, yeah, your, nerve, your bones are collapsing, pressing your nerve, and you can get that stooped posture. Uh, more on osteoporosis, this is the joint between the humerus and the, uh, make sure I know what I'm talking about. This is between the humerus and the radius and ulna. In any case, you can see the, the density of the bone here. And you look there, you see all this open space, definitely not good thing. Um, 
female and postmenopausal is definitely a risk factor. Let me pull that down so you can see me. Not that I think that's a big important thing, but let's try to be nice. Steroid use, uh, thin, small, petite women, alcohol, and of course, age, family history. Uh, significant smoking history and couch potato uh, oh low testosterone I was trying to these things are really small on my screen smoking we've already talked about <coughs> anything that interferes with calcium and vitamin D is going to be a problem or anything else that causes you to have problems with calcium can lead to thin bones and very brittle they you take calcium and vitamin D and they've got actually medications that help with that we're almost to the end guys <coughs> Paget's disease of the bone this is something that's long term this is a process your bones are going to we know we do remodeling but this is the thing, these guys break the bones down and then the remodeling isn't according to where the stress is or the weight that you now have to bear. It's kind of kind of random. And this thing is going to be larger than a normal bone and way weaker. And it, a lot of, it looks similar to osteoporosis only you get this really larger size. Uh, excessive breakdown and regrowth, too quickly, bigger and softer, easily fractured, usually just one or so bones are involved. Nobody knows what causes it, environment may be, and in some cases folks have inherited this. And of course, <coughs> this is something older people and those are from Northern Europe now here's the thing of Paget's now it looks a little bit like the osteoporosis but if you notice this leg is much bigger than this one and if you look over here on the x-ray you can see that but look at this how how it looks almost like the osteoporosis look how thin and weird that the trabecula is it's just not going to be strong enough it's no wonder it's it's leaning like that and obviously this can lead to broken bones. Now this is something almost everybody's going to get. Um, this is just wear and tear arthritis, osteoarthritis. About 30 some million people in the, in the U.S. have this. Uh, mostly going to be your hands, your hips, your knees. The things that go, that get worked out a lot. We use our hands every day our hips and our knees for walking and of course if we put any extra weight on it just makes it worse what happens is the cartilage between the two bones breaks down and it's not replaced now they do have joint replacement surgeries for knees and hips so i mean it's there's some hope for this <clears throat> i'm sure they're very expensive i know for a fact Having having several friends and patients with it, it's very painful. Uh, when it breaks down, you get all kinds of things. The joint space is obviously going to get narrower because the cartilage is gone. You can get cysts there. You can get sclerosis. In other words, these bones are rubbing against each other and they're kind of grinding. And then you can get these osteophytes. Osteophytes are just pieces of bone, little like bone icicles that hang off and they can get in the way of nerves and cause pain these guys this is something that's going to happen over time uh, pain stiffness swelling some and it's going to reduce your abilities to do certain things and to uh, function as you used to this can be differentiated from rheumatoid arthritis uh, Rheumatoid arthritis, we actually have, it's bilateral, so if you've got rheumatoid arthritis in your fingers, you're going to have it from fingers on both sides. This guy is not necessarily bilateral, because 
If you're left-handed, you're more likely to have arthritis, osteoarthritis in your left hand, same for right. But you can see the, the changes here versus the normal finger bones. <coughs> also, this actually kind of gets a little bit better as you go along in the day. It starts off rough and then gets better. Rheumatoid starts off okay and then gets worse. Clicking or cracking, grinding sounds, slow onset, mild. We already talked about stiffness, the hips, knees, and hands, most common. Bone spurs, those are the osteophytes. Yeah, it does make it hard to climb stairs. Bone dislocations. We talked about bone fractures in Chapter 6. Dislocation is called a, lux, a luxation, and that's a complete dislocation of the bones from one to another, and I'll show you some videos. Now, that's a partial dislocation is just called a subluxation. <coughs> a lot of times, this is going to be some sort of trauma impact, hitting something, a fall. Something is going to put force on it and move this bone away from its joint. And of course, when it does that, it can damage ligaments and tendons and muscles and even nerves. <coughs> These guys can occur in just about any joint, but mostly the one that's most apt to have a dislocation is the shoulder. The shoulder joint has the greatest range of motion of any of our joints, but it's also the least stable. And there's not a very deep, if you guys remember, the glenoid fossa is fairly shallow. It's not as deep as the acetabulum for the head of the femur, but shoulder closed reduction, that's where we move it and put it back in place. Uh, this is something you need to go to the hospital or to the doctor and get it done. <coughs> if it's done by someone not qualified, they can actually cause more damage to the to the tissues around the joint. So here's our shoulder dislocation. Normally, you can see this is a anterior and there's a posterior. The, and what you would do is pull and put it back in. That's not a that's not a a pleasant experience. Here's our here's our um, X-ray. You can see this guy is is out of the joint, and this been they did a close a closed relocation and they pushed it back in. Well, guys, that's it for Chapter 7. I will see you guys in Chapter 8 in just a little while. Thanks a lot. See ya.